Today I'm so excited because I will share with you how Orthodox Jewish women shop in non-Jewish store for modest clothes, as well as five things we look for to make sure an outfit is modest according to our laws of modesty, including what materials they are made of, as some materials are forbidden to be worn according to our Jewish customs. I will also answer many questions I received from the last Jewish clothing store tour video, including do I need to be modest in my house? alone with my family, do I wear pants, and so much more. And if you're new here, hi, my name is Sarah Malka, and on my channel, I share all facets of my Orthodox Sephardic Jewish life as a full-time working mom with small kiddos. So please don't forget to leave this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Let me put on a pretty tichel and let's jump into it. After a 20 minutes drive, we arrive at Winners. It is the equivalent of TJ Maxx or Marshalls in the USA or TK Maxx in Europe here in Canada. I thought it would be fun to go there as it is a large retail store and it is found in so many countries around the world, but whether this store or any non-Jewish clothing store I go, I will always look for the same five things to make sure an outfit is modest. When we enter the women's section of this store, we have the blouse or blouse in French, which brings us to the first thing we look for in an outfit to be modest, and in this case for a blouse to be modest, and that is the gaps and length of the top. As Orthodox Jewish women, ideally our shirts or blouses have to be loose enough not to be form-fitting, not to have big gaps between the buttons to avoid seeing the undergarments, the sleeves should fall below the elbows, and the neckline of the shirt should cover the collarbone as well. To find a blouse that answers all these characteristics in a non-Jewish clothing store is almost impossible. And this is why we develop hacks to be able to wear clothing from non-Jewish store and make them modest. For example, looking at both of these blouses, none of them would be considered modest on their own. So a quick fix to be able to wear them would be to wear a shell or undershirt underneath both of them. We have already spoken about the shells in the previous Jewish clothing store video and they are cotton undershirt that we wear under our clothes. They come of course in so many colors and I will leave the link below the video to help you find these shells if you need them. Using a shell would compensate for the wider opening of the pink blouse and the v-cut of the white blouse, as well as it would cover the midsection of the person wearing the white top as it is quite short. For me personally, albeit I find these blouses very cute, I would not purchase them because the white one would accentuate my midsection and the material for the pink one looks like it is a high maintenance material being so wrinkled even just hanging on the hanger. And I'm more a low maintenance material kind of gal. How about you? Would you also put back a cute piece of clothing because it needs a lot of TLC like dry cleaning and steaming? Let me know in the comments below. Next to the shirts we have other tops and the same rules of modesty apply for the tops and for the blouses. Usually there is no problem with the material used to make shirts and tops unless they are made of wool and I will talk about this a bit later in the video. Some tops are not salvageable and could not be adapted to be considered modest for Orthodox Jewish women like the next two tops. This one, even with its long sleeves, has a very large neckline and has a very narrow cut so it would not be loose enough and therefore it would cling to the body. Also, with its large neckline, it would not cover the collarbone, which are two essential qualities for a top to be considered modest. This second top could also not be transformed into a modest top, and it is pretty self-explanatory why, because it is tight, short, and sleeveless with a large neckline. Some people could try to wear a shell underneath both of the previous tops, but I think it would be almost impossible for them to become modest, especially with the issue of being too tight around the chest area. On a side note, contrary to popular belief, we can wear colored clothes and not only black and white clothes as Orthodox Jewish women. For example, this beautiful mustard shirt. I really like the details of the top and I think that if it's worn with a black shell underneath, a nice straight cut black skirt mid-calf and short dressy ankle boots with a nice mustard scarf, I think that the ensemble would look stunning and I would absolutely take it today, but unfortunately it's not my size. 
And yes, I will show you how I dress for work, Shabbat and the holidays in the next video. So stay tuned and do not forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on your notification bell not to miss that episode. I will also include how I style this top too. Some of you were wondering, how do I stay dressed modestly to train or do any sports or activities? Well, if I'm doing any kind of sports in public, whether indoors or outdoors, I will wear my sporty skirt with leggings and a long sleeve top with a beanie to cover my hair like I have showed you in my video on how I stayed at a non-Jewish hotel video and I will leave the link above and the description box below. If I train and I am home alone, I can wear what I want and do not need to follow the rules of modesty per se, but I still prefer to stay covered so I would wear a t-shirt with leggings and no head covering, but if my children are around, I would wear a head covering and longer sleeves as I think it is important for children to see their parents covered and maintain a certain decorum and sense of dignity around them. On a side note, even if I'm alone, I would never wear these shorts because they are simply too revealing and I would not feel comfortable in them. What do you think? Would these shorts be a yay or a nay for you? Let me know in the comments below. Next to the sport gear, there is the bathing suit section. And here is another question you have asked me from the previous video. If I go to an all-women pool or beach, can I wear a regular bathing suit like this one? And the answer is yes. But for me, I prefer to stay modest, especially in front of my children. And also as a side benefit, the sun protection is amazing with a modest bathing suit. Next, we find the pants. Many of you asked me if wearing pants are considered modest for Orthodox Jewish women, as long pair of pants cover the legs completely. And the answer is no, because in the Torah it is written in Deuteronomy 22.5, a woman must not put on man's apparel, and pants are traditionally worn by men. So even if they're wide and loose or covered with a tunic, it is a no for us to wear them outside the house. Some of us will wear PJ pants in the privacy of our house, but some Orthodox Jewish women will abstain from wearing any kind of pants, whether PJ pants or any form of pants. Like in our Costco kosher haul, we have random items between aisles of clothing, like this aisle where we can find food. And I wanted to show you how we find kosher food even at a TJ Maxx. We look at the products and we look for kosher certification because only looking at the ingredients is not enough since whether the FDA or other food agencies around the world allow to have additives not mentioned in the list of ingredients and this is why we search for a kosher certification. When there is a kosher certification, it does not mean the food was blessed by a rabbi, but it means that the food has no mixture of meat and milk no presence of seafood, and there are no extra non-kosher additives found in the food. There are different kosher certification. OU is the most popular, and it stands for Orthodox Union. There is also Star K, which is very popular. Usually, there is a kosher certification agency in most large cities where you have a Jewish community. Therefore, there are hundreds of kosher symbols around the world, but not all of them are reliable. And if you want for me to explain to you a bit more what is kosher food and the kosher certification system, please let me know in the comments below. And on a side note, as a little experiment, I would encourage you to look in your local grocery and look at your labels on the food you buy regularly, beside meat, of course, and see if you find a kosher certification. And if you do, please let me know in the comments below what product you found and what kind of certification. Because I'm curious to know if you ever realized how many products are kosher in your regular supermarket. After the Isle of Food, we have an Isle of Sweaters, and in it we will find the second thing we look for for an outfit to be kosher, and in this case, for specifically for any knitwear to be kosher for any Orthodox Jews, men or women alike. And that is, we have to make sure there is no mixture of wool and linen in the list of components, as it is forbidden to mix them together, 
whether woven together or found in the same garment because the prohibition to wear these two material is found in the Torah and it tells us mix in linen and wool together and to use the mixture to wear or to drape oneself with such item is forbidden as written in Leviticus 19.19 and Deuteronomy 22.11. And this is why we always have to look at the labels for sweaters, suits, scarves, even blankets to see what they're made of. For example, when I look at this baby pink sweater, my first step is to look at the label. In this case, it shows polyester, nylon, and viscose, which are non-problematic fibers, but I'm not a big fan of too many synthetic fibers, and also this sweater has a stain on it, so it goes back on the rack. When I look at this other sweater, I see wool in the list of fibers and it is made in Europe, so it's a double strike and I know for sure I will have to bring it to a Shatner's laboratory where they use a 100x microscope to see if in the wool there are threads of linen interwoven in the wool. The people who do this examination are very careful and they make sure not to destroy the clothes they are verifying. The same holds true for suits, especially the one made in Europe and also some made in China, as they often use linen to build a suit to reinforce the color and shoulders, which are more common in higher end wool suits for men and women. And if you are curious if it is permitted to try on a garment in a clothing store without knowing whether it has Shatnez or not, if the label clearly states that the garment includes both wool and linen, then it is prohibited to try it in the store, but if it's only written wool or linen, then there is no problem for you to try it on. The prohibition of Shatnez applies not only to suits, coats, dresses and pants, but any type of clothing, including socks, pajamas, gloves, wool scarves, ties, and even blankets, as we drape ourselves in them to stay warm. Like in this blanket, made in Europe, when you see OF on the label, which stands for other fibers, often it can be an indication that linen and wool were mixed together in the threads, so it also needs to be verified in a Shatnus laboratory. The same way we would bring the wool blanket to be checked, we would also bring this linen set to the Shatnus laboratory because even if it's written 100% linen or 100% wool on the label, in the USA the manufacturer is allowed to have up to 2% of OF or other fibers mixed in without having to put the extra fibers on the label. On a side note, did you ever try linen bed sheets? Are they worth the 150 Canadian dollars? Are they better than the 500 count cotton bed sheets, which are about a third of the price of a linen set? I would love to know in the comments below what has been your experience with this linen set and if you think they are worth the hype and the price. In a nutshell regarding chatness or the mixture of linen and wool, just like with kosher food, simply reading the label on a garment may not tell the whole story of what the clothes is made of. The next up are dresses and skirts. Today, unfortunately, there were no skirts I could show you as they were all oh so short, but they had plenty of dresses and this is where we will find the item number three we look for to make sure an outfit is modest and or kosher, and that is the length of the dress or skirt. As Orthodox Jewish women, our skirts or dresses have to be two to four inches below the knee to be considered modest. And this is where I use my super nifty tool I spoke to you about in the last video that my friend Ruth created to make it easy when you are alone, in a store, or even with friends to see if the skirt is long enough to be considered modest. It is a Plastify 4 inches measuring tool with an elastic on top. I put the elastic just below my knee and it will help me to see how low does a skirt or a dress fall below my knee when I'm standing while I'm looking in the mirror. So this lovely black dress is the right size and it seems long enough at first glance, but when I put the dress in front of me, it seems modest from my point of view, but when I look closely, the dress does not even reach the 2 inches mark, so back on the rack it goes. 
Let me try again with this cafe au lait dress which would be so cute worn for the winter with a skin-tight black turtleneck underneath with dressy boots and a cute chocolate headscarf, but once again, it does not even reach the 2 inches mark. I finally see a maxi dress and this one for sure is gonna be modest. It is so beautiful and with a white shell and a white cotton slip to make it opaque, it would be rendered modest and it would be so cute worn with sandals for the summer. On a side note, some dresses, like the tops, are not even worth to be tried to be rendered modest. Which brings us to the fourth item we look for for an outfit to be modest, and more specifically for a dress or a skirt to be modest, and that is the absence of a slit. As Orthodox Jewish women, our skirts or dresses should not have a high slit because when worn alone with nothing under it, the legs are not covered properly, and even with a lower slit below the knee, it draws attention with its peekaboo effect. There are many ways to conceal a slit, like to close the slit completely, or adding fabric to close the slit, or wearing a second skirt underneath the skirt, or dress, but it becomes so bulky and it alters so much the look of the skirt or dress that I think it defies the purpose altogether. And this brings us to the fifth item we look for for any item of clothing to be considered modest as Orthodox Jewish women, and that is the color of the garment. These dresses, whether the red one or the blue one, are way too flashy and would not be considered modest and could not be worn outside the house. But yes, technically, if I would want to wear any non-modest clothes, like a bright red dress or a pair of pants in my house, I could potentially wear these items. But personally, I would not because I want to maintain a level of sanctity in our house and also by maintaining a sense of modesty in our Orthodox Jewish home, it is a way for us to teach our children how precious the commandment of modesty is inside and outside the house. Thank you for being here. It means the world to me. And know that in my book, you are beautiful inside and out. And if you're here with me until the end, please write in the comments. I love modesty, so I know I was not alone. And if nobody told you today, know that you are loved and you are enough just the way you are. Until next time, stay safe, stay blessed, and don't forget to from it up. Like a bet in Greek fountains Or lay lazy in bed With your head on my chest I hope you don't mind If I say